What is old is new again. Longtime listeners of this podcast will remember that I have an affinity for IBM. IBM was one of my early muses for SourceCast. I have spent a lot of time between the blog and the podcast covering what Big Blue is up to. I was, and I continue to be, fascinated by their transformation. I want to say into a cloud company, but that's likely not correct. At this point, I think it would be fair to say that their transformation is more focused on artificial intelligence and blockchain and security, with cloud humming around in the background. My coverage of IBM has dropped over the last six or seven months, and it was really a combination of me wanting to take the podcast in different directions and expand the scope, because honestly, there's only so much news that IBM or Oracle is going to produce in a given week, and to that point, there really wasn't a lot of net new IBM information that I hadn't already covered. So I took a break from IBM. But over the last three weeks, there has been a string of IBM articles that made me give them more attention, more focus. And when I started combining the stories together to see how they fit, there was a thread of stories that I could put together into a picture. So this week, we're talking about the state of the state of IBM. I'm Joey Lombardi. And this is SourceCast episode 116. I'm going to start this story with stock performance, but I start with a caveat. A few weeks ago, I did a podcast on Oracle stock issues, and one of my college buddies took me to task. Shout out to Jughead if you're listening. He made a very valid point, which I corrected in the following week's SourceCast, that this stock performance, these hits that companies like Oracle and IBM have taken, it's so reactionary for such minor hits. It's almost as if the stock market is looking for these minor infractions to penalize companies. So Jughead, point well taken. And the focus of this week's episode is not specifically around the stock. I'm just using this as an opener. So that being said, last Wednesday, April 18th, IBM's stock dropped 7.5%. And this occurred in spite of relatively good financial performance, relatively stable sales. The stock still dropped. CNBC's Sarah Salinas wrote that the tech company announced better than expected earnings and revenue on Tuesday. But IBM reported margins that exempting one-time boosts from workforce restructuring and changes to the U.S. tax code were mostly flat year over year. The 7.5% drop knocked $11 billion off the company's previous market cap of $148.2 billion. And according to Salinas, puts IBM well into correction territory at more than 13% off its 52-week high. Most of the reading that I've done about this hit is due to the stock market's skepticism of IBM transformation, their concern about soft legacy equipment sales, and the fact that their new business targets, artificial intelligence, blockchain, cloud, security, they're growing, but they're not setting the world on fire. And that leads me to an article by Dana Blackenhorn from InvestorPlace.com that calls out IBM for being too small to compete in the cloud era. Blackenhorn makes these three points, and I quote, its latest quarter shows revenue of $19.1 billion dollars and a net income of $1.7 billion, which is $1.81 per share. That is two-thirds of what Microsoft Corporation brought in in the last quarter. Microsoft has a market cap of $742 billion, and is more than five times IBM's $137 billion market cap. The second point, and I quote, IBM only has $12 billion in cash. By contrast, Facebook, which is the least well-capitalized of all of the cloud czars, has $40 billion in cash and short-term securities to sustain investments. Point number three, IBM simply lacks the financial power to win the Department of Defense contract, which we've been talking about over the last few weeks. So IBM does not have the financial firepower to win the Department of Defense contract because it prioritized shareholders over investment early in this decade. This Black and Horn article was very feisty. She also kind of mentions that IBM was excellent at managing press releases as opposed to introducing new technology that worked. I don't know if I necessarily agree with all of that, but it is an interesting connection to make. In my coverage of IBM over the last few years, it's clear that their stock performance hasn't been setting the world on fire. 
It's been years of decline, and we've seen two quarters now of some degree of stabilization. So anytime you see a company that has years of revenue decline, there isn't a strong signal that they're out of the woods yet. There's going to be questions about leadership. And there will always be questions about IBM's performance from Seeking Alpha. There's a whole IBM and Seeking Alpha feud that's been going on for years, and I have thoroughly enjoyed covering it on the blogs and on the podcasts for the last three or four years. It was one of my early inside jokes. And James Brumley, a contributor to Seeking Alpha, he very gently calls out whether or not Ginny Romady should be removed from her position. And he starts by quoting a Forbes article by Peter Cohen. So I double quote this one. Can IBM turn things around and become a company that persistently beats analyst expectations for revenue and profit growth as it raises its forecasts? I don't think so. That's because it lacks a sustainable competitive advantage. Cohen goes on to say the reason for this missing competitive advantage is the right CEO. He uses Satya Nadella at Microsoft as an example of the growth that a company can experience with the right leader. Brumley goes on to say that when Ginny took over in 2012, she didn't embrace the modern era of technology. That took her three years with the launch of the company's strategic imperatives. And even through that, she hasn't embraced all the initiatives in earnest. Brumley calls out Watson as an interesting proof of concept, but we're not seeing widespread adoption in the corporate or private sector. And Brumley even quotes a Gizmodo article that covers the fact that even people within IBM hate Watson, including the people who made it. By the way, that was an article by Jennings Brown from August of 2017. The bottom line on AI and IBM is that while Watson has branding and some degree of market recognition, there are several competitors that have lapped Watson's capabilities and have likely done so at considerably less cost. Brumley's articles actually call out mainframe, storage, physical machinery, and equipment as highlights. And that's actually a good transition point. It seems to me that all of the good IBM news that's making it out to the news feeds always centers around CPUs, quantum computing, or some kind of small microprocessor or sensor that's helping to contribute to the Internet of Things. Recently, IBM unveiled the world's smallest computer. This is actually kind of insane. They managed to put together an x86 processor which is something you would see in a 1990s era computer. But they have the chip, the memory, storage, and a communication module on something that you need a microscope to see. And they're producing these things for like 10 cents. So in theory, you can put these things anywhere. Credit cards, sensors, cars, you name it. They're small, they're cheap, they're portable, and there's a lot of interesting applications. But there's the rub. IBM makes a lot of really cool things that have a lot of potential in a variety of applications, but none of this stuff ever seems to get out of the lab. AI and quantum computing could very well be groundbreaking, humanity-changing technology, and IBM has been at the forefront of this research for years. But Microsoft and Google, they've been making just as many innovations, and they keep applying those technologies and wins back into their business. IBM can't seem to find a way to translate these wins into actual profits. So when you have a company that's had 20 straight quarters of decline, they're having a hard time selling their new technologies to business customers, what do you think happens? There are staff reductions. But the way IBM has been undergoing those staff reductions has been coming under a lot of criticism lately. A few weeks ago, ProPublica published a very damning article covering how IBM has been decimating their, I'm not even going to say elderly, aged workforce. The article by Peter Goslin and Ariana Tobin goes on to say that IBM has eliminated more than 20,000 American employees ages 40 or over over the last five years, which was about 60% of its estimated total U.S. job cuts during those years. Here are a couple highlights from the article, and I quote, IBM denied older workers information the law says they need in order to decide whether they've been victims of age bias. And IBM required former employees to sign away the rights to go to court or join others to seek redress, aka no class action lawsuits. IBM targeted people for layoffs and firings with techniques that tilted against older workers, even when the company rated them high performers. In some instances, the money saved from the departures went towards hiring young replacements. The company converted job cuts into retirement and took steps to boost resignations and firings. 
The moves reduce the number of employees counted as layoffs, where high numbers can trigger public disclosure requirements. IBM encouraged employees targeted for layoffs to apply for other IBM positions while quietly advising managers not to hire them and requiring many of the workers to train their replacements. I had to say that one, if it's true, that's horrible. And finally, IBM told some older employees being laid off that their skills were out of date, but then brought them back as contract workers, often for the same work at lower pay and fewer benefits. If you're middle-aged and you're working for a corporation, I'm sure a lot of these points resonate with you. I don't think the tactics that IBM are deploying are unique to IBM. I don't think that it's right, but they are clearly riding some fine line between legal and illegal. And frankly, they're going to win that game. Even though 50 years ago, Congress made age discrimination illegal with the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, also known as ADEA, in recent years, courts have not been enforcing those rules. And they're basically responding to corporations and companies saying they need greater leeway to be competitive with offshore companies. And by no means am I condoning this behavior, but I don't think IBM is unique here. They just happen to be a 100-year-old company that at one point was probably a really awesome place to work at and definitely had an awesome culture that really spun the technology foundation of America, or at least one of the founding companies that spun this foundation. And now they're just like any other place to work. Maybe even a little worse, if these articles are to be believed. If you want to see more about this topic, there is an excellent YouTube video created by Vox that you can find if you type in on YouTube, How IBM Quietly Pushed Out 20,000 Aging Workers. It's short, it's well-produced, and it's very informative. I highly recommend you see it. I will have it embedded in next week's supplier report if you can't find it yourself. But in watching the video, they quoted thousands of IBM employees that have been let go. And one comment said, for the last few years, I feel like I've had a target on my back. And every day I go to work, I don't know if it's going to be my last. And I have friends that work at IBM right now. And without getting too specific, that quote hits home based on everything that I've heard. So when you see companies like Amazon who are thriving and succeeding, and who have openly bragged about hiring older employees because of their experience and their general corporate knowledge, I'm not quite sure why IBM would willingly let all of those people and all of that knowledge go out the door. There really seems to be a disconnect on their strategies. I don't know what's going to happen to IBM in the future. I won't hide my affection or affinity for the company. I've said it many times that I like those older companies. I want to see them transform and I want to see them succeed. Many of the actions that they've taken leave me scratching my head and wondering what the true value is for some of these decisions. They seem very short-sighted. I do have concerns that IBM's great hope in Watson is not going to be realized. I do think that other companies are starting to lap them. And I haven't seen a practical business application from Watson outside of the H&R Block tax return software, which I didn't hear anything about this year. That was a big deal last year. Haven't heard a peep this year. For months, I've been reading that IBM is winning the game in blockchain, but I still haven't seen any practical business applications for blockchain yet. I've heard of theories, and they sound promising, but I don't see anybody making any real money on blockchain with the exception of those crypto miners. I feel like I say this every time I talk about IBM. I hope they make it out of their transformation, and I'm starting to think that maybe it is time for them to start to explore other leadership options. I'm rooting for you, Big Blue. Good luck. And that's all we have for this week. You can find Storycast on iTunes, Google Music, and all of your favorite podcasting applications. Storycast is recorded. And we call it Mandalay, New Jersey. And it's produced by my dad. The outro is performed by me, Ben Lombardi. And music is provided by Patrick Lee. Thanks for listening. And we'll be back next week.